Yes, uh, we are about to start our lecture today. Yes, sure, sure. I'm, I'm here. I, I already turned on my camera, but I don't know. I cannot see myself also. Uh, I can see you. Oh, so. That's great. Um, so I will introduce um, to the students first, and then I will hand it over to you. Sure, sure.好的，各位同学，下午好。呃，欢迎来到由广西职业技术学院农业工程学院主办的丝路茶文化大师讲堂。今天的呃大师来自泰国亚洲理工学院，哈亚乌拉博士。他今天带来的讲座是苗圃管
and uh, for future collaboration. So these are the links for my Google site, for my Scopus, for Google Scholar, for ResearchGate. So you are welcome to uh, go and through my profiles. And if you are interested to have a collaboration in the future, I will be more than happy to do that. So with this, uh, let me go to the presentation. So today, in this one hour, I will be talking about a basic introduction of the tea, which is, of course, very much important for all of us to know that how much tea is produced globally, how much it is consumed on a global scale, who are the major producers, and then after that, I will be talking about directly go to the nursery management because tea propagation is something which is, which is very much critical job. So I will be talking about the tea propagation, the nursery condition, the nursery organization, land requirements, soil requirements, manuring, weeding, spraying, pest management. So these all topics comes under the nursery organization. Then uh, we will also focus on the beds preparation and the cuttings. Planting cutting means cutting and then how to do, how to plant those cuttings. Then what are, why shed is required for the nursery and what are the requirements for the waters? And then up at the end, how to transplant the seedling from the nursery into the field. So these are some of the, the basic topics which I will try to cover uh, in this one hour. So let's talk about the uh, global production and consumption of the tea. So tea is a popular shrub and it is uh, the, the botanical name or the biological name is uh, Camellia sinensis. And this is produced throughout the world because it is an evergreen shrub. But this is one of the most popular beverage after water, second most important beverage after water, and about three billions of tea cups are consumed per day at the global scale. So there are four types of the tea classified based on their, their, their texture and based on their structure. Number one is called the Chinese big leaf tea. This is coming from the variety Macrophylla. Macrophylla, the name itself indicates their big leaf. Macro means large, phyla means leaf. So this is the large leaf tea. Then we have another uh, variety which is called small Chinese small leaf tea. And the shrub is the same, Camellia sinensis, but the variety is called Bohia. Then we have another third type, it is called Shanti. And again, the same shrub, but the variety is called Shan. And then the fourth one, we have Indian tea, where the variety is Asamita. So these four varieties of tea are largely identified by the researchers at global scale. And uh, for you, uh, certainly you will be happy to know that the, there are about 5,159 million kilograms of tea produced at the global scale. And the area under tea cultivation is about 3.84 million hectare. And tea is produced by more than 50 countries of the world. But this is a good news for all of you that China is the largest producer of tea with about 1980 million kg of tea from which, which is about 38.38% of the total tea production in the global scale, followed by India with about 1200 or 1185 million kilograms. And the three largest producers of the, of the uh, tea are China, India, and Kenya. These are the three major producers of the tea. And these three countries only, they contribute to about 71% of the global tea production. So it means that even though tea is produced as in more than 50 countries, but 71% of the tea is produced only in these three countries, which is China, India, and Kenya. So these three countries are the major producers 
of tea and more than 3 billion cup of tea is consumed every day. So at this background, let's most, this is the, the map of the world where the tea is produced. And if you see, so the, the dark green color indicates a country which are uh, tea producing countries, which is about 50 countries in the world. Now, uh, to propagate the tea, how tea is propagated or how tea is, you can say, germinated or produced. So there are two methods for the tea propagation. One is the seed, tea propagation from the seeds. And the second one is the vegetative propagation. So let me explain that vegetative propagation is something where a plant is produced from the parts of the plant other than the seeds. For example, the roots, the stem, the branches, or the leaves. So that is called vegetative propagation. Vegetative propagation is a kind of asexual reproduction where the offsprings or the, the, the organisms or the plants which are produced are identical to their parents. So there is no genetic verification or modification of these plants. So most of the gardeners, they prefer to go for the seedlings, not for the seed, because it is easy. And But in addition to the seedling, seed can also be used as a method of propagation. It is not a exact science, but uh, you can use seed as well. And the tea germination, the, the germination of tea seed requires about eight weeks. So the eight weeks are needed for the seed to germinate. Now, <clears throat> if, if we are going for the germination of the seed, then the seeds are collected from the berries. Berry is the kind of fruit. It is a kind of fruit where, where the seeds are dispersed within, within the fruit. And then the seeds are germinated by 20 by 20 centimeter triangles. Mean, let's say this type of, of, of map. So 20, here we, we sow one seed, here we sow one seed and here. So a triangular structure with 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter space, this can be used for the seed germination. And then just like nursery, the shade is also needed for the seed berries because uh, direct sunlight will have a very serious impact on the uh, tea seeds. The tea which is grown from the seed, and if you are going to germinate the, the, the seeds, then the first thing you need to do is to soak the seed in water for about 24 to 48 hours. And then this soaking will help the seed to start their germination process. It will break the dormancy and it will start the germination process. And that is why pre-soaking of the seed will have more chances of germination. After soaking, you need to put the seed in the seed trays and keep the trays in a warm and sunny location for some time. And make sure to spray the soil to keep it damp. Means uh, the, the seed should not be exposed. Seed should be covered with the soil. And expose, uh, expect to see germination occur in six to eight weeks. And after the seed have germinated and developed three to four leaves, then it is the time to move them into their permanent home or to their large container. So uh, let me just recap the slide very easily for you. So there are two ways to germinate the seed. One, uh, sorry, there are two ways to germinate the tea. One is germination from the seed, and the other is germination from the clones or the vegetative parts. So in this slide, I have talked about only the seed. So seed germination is not a popular method, number one, but still, it can be used as a, as a method for propagation. The seeds are collected from the berries, which are mature, and then the seeds are germinated in a triangular manner with 20 by 20 centimeter, uh, 20 by 20 centimeter space. And once you, you put the, so the seed in the trays, cover them with the soil, and keep them in a location which is warm and sunny for some time. 
And then you also need to spray water and soil. And after that, about six to eight weeks, it will require for the seed berries to germinate. It is quite long time. Six to eight weeks is quite long time for germination. Once the seed germinate, then you need to wait for the seedling to grow about three to four leaves. Once they are about three to four leaves large, or, or they, have, they have grown up to three to four leaves, then you are free to take the seedlings and put them into their permanent home, either large container, or you can directly take them into the, 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 the field. So this is how the first method of germination or the first method of propagation works. Now let's go to the, this is the berries. You see berries look like this way. And then there are the seeds, you can take them and you can use for the germination. So the lower picture showed the nursery and the upper, portion, the upper photo is showing the berries of the tea, which can be used as a method for propagation. Then let's come to the nursery. So nursery conditions are very much critical. What type of environment within the nursery, what type of environment uh, around the nursery, that will be very much needed for successful propagation of the tea. So number one, the nursery should be properly drained. That means there should be no standing water because water logging is very much disastrous for the nursery. So there, the nursery, wherever you plan or you are planning to make a nursery, make sure that there is no standing water. Water logging is very much disastrous for the nursery. So this is the first thing. Number two, the availability of water is also very important. Means availability of water according to the requirements. Means how much, how much uh, irrigation is required According to that, there should be ample apply or supply of water. So not standing water, but there should be sufficient water to make proper irrigation. This is needed. Then the soil should be tested for the pH. This is very much uh, a critical condition, the pH of the soil. And let me tell you that this is one of the major reasons that the many areas of the world, they are not ready for uh, tea propagation because the tea need a slightly acidic pH. Soil pH should be slightly acidic and eel worm, which is one of the most disastrous type of, uh, of, of worm, that, is, uh, that should be removed from the soil. So eel worm, first of all, you should check the soil for the pH. The ideal pH should be between 4.5 and the, there should be no eel worm in the soil. If there are eel worm, that will have a very bad impact on the nursery. So there should be no eel worm and the pH of the soil should be between 4.5 to 5. So this is acidic pH. And if the pH is high, let's say you are interested in some area to make tea nursery, and the pH of the soil is high, then there are two uh, possible approaches which you can, you can do. Number one, you apply sulfur. Sulfur is very good in making the, bringing the pH towards acidic. So sulfur and peat moss. Peat moss is a bryophyte, sphagnum. This is also very much helpful in making the alkaline pH towards acidic pH. So you can, you, you can apply either sulfur or you can apply peat moss. And these two things will help you reducing the pH of the soil and making it uh, ideal or suitable for the nursery uh, cultivation. And the next thing which is very much important is fumigation. Fumigation is spray. The recommended spray of fungicide or bacterial side or uh, any, any spray which is needed for killing the pathogen that is also very much essential. So for the ideal condition, the nursery site should be properly drained. There should be, uh, water should be available for irrigation. The pH of the soil should be between 4.5 to 5. Acidic pH, if the pH was high, then you can apply either sulfur or peat moss or both of them so that the pH is ideal for the propagation of the nursery. And then you can also use fumigation 
fumigation means spray of the respective or the required uh, sprays. So this is also uh, the precondition of the nursing. So this is the sulfur and peat moss. Both of them are commercially available. So if, uh, uh, first of all, you should do the soil testing. If you find the soil uh, pH is more than five, then you can apply either sulfur or peat moss or both of them. And then it will bring the soil pH lower. Then let's go to the nursing organization. And the, the first thing is the land requirement. How much land do you need to have the, uh, the, the nursery? So there are three common methods. Three. Number one, if you are making beds, bed in the nursery, and then uh, you are making the you are you are putting the planting there, and then after the small quality baskets you are using, and then it will be going to the field. So that is one method that you are making beds in the nursery and then the small uh, transplanting the plant from the beds and small quality beds and then going to the field. This is one method. The second, if you are using rooting directly into the polythene cylinders with a spec open and then you go to the field. This is the second method. And the third method is rooting in the beds and then you remove the naked root, not or cover in the, in the polythene bed and then going to the field. So three methods, let me explain again. The first and second method is that you uh, make the beds in the nursery, you put the plant, the, the, the cutting in the beds, when the roots are developed, you remove the roots, the, the planting into the polythene beds and then transfer the polythene bed and the plants into the field. This is one method. The second method is that you put the planting directly into the polythene nursery, you plant in the nursery, and once the roots are developed, then you go into the field. This is the second. The third one, you make the, you put the, the planting or the, the cutting into the soil without any polythene bag. When the roots are developed, you remove the planting with the roots and then go to the field. These are the three methods. So all beds should be three feet wide and parts are assumed to be about 20 inches wide. If you are making beds in the nursery, so make sure that you are making three foot, uh, three feet wide uh, beds, and there should be, between the two beds, there should be a space of at least 20 inches so that one can room around and one can move around whenever it is required. Then how much should be the distance between the rows and the distance in the rows? So it should be three by three inch or three by four inch. Means the two plants should be gap by three inch, three inch by three inch or three inch by four inch. So the two rows, two rows, means one row, another row, and the, the distance between the two rows should be three inch by three inch or three inch by four inch. And within the row, one plant and another plant should be away by three inch and three inch, or three inch and four inch. So this is how the, the beds should be arranged in the nursery. And according to this, if you are going, so if you are going to have three by three inch spacing, then in one square yard, you can plant about 141 cuttings. If you are making a distance of three by four inch, then in one square yard, there will be about 108 cuttings. And if you increase the spacing means four by four inch, then the number of cutting in one square yard area will be about 81. So this is up to you, whether you make three by three inch spacing, three by four inch spacing, or more four by four inch spacing. And the more spacing you keep, the number of planting or cuttings will be getting lower and lower. So this is how you can arrange the nursery. Then land requirements, uh, we continue with the previous line. This is the polythene beds with the T planting. The distance between the rows and the distance at the rows for basket and polythene cylinders depend on the size of the basket or polythene cylinder. Some examples are given here. So now, if you are using the, uh, the basket 
or you are using the polythene cylinder for the for nursery, then how much you can do? How much planting or how much cuttings can be can be grown in one square yard? So if the polythene cylinder is small, which means nine inch long and four inch diameter, then you can have about 90 bags in one square yard. Nine by four inch uh, size. So then you can have about 90 uh, polythene bags or cylinder. If the polythene cylinders are long, which means 10 inches long and six inches in diameter, then in one square yard, you can keep about 30 bags. And if you are using baskets, means the big size, which are seven inches long and five inches in diameter, then you can put about 60 basket in one square yard distance. So it depends on what type of uh, polythene bags or what size of polythene bags you are using. And this will be the formula for you to arrange them in one square yard uh, space. I hope it is, it is uh, clear. So then what type of soil is, is required? This is very much uh, important discussion. So the soil, the volume of earth in cubic feet in relation to the depth of the top soil layer per square yard of nursery bed and the total volume per square yard of polythene cylinders and baskets. So now you, this first sentence is very critical. Please try to understand. The volume of the earth in one cubic feet in relation to the depth, how much deep you are going, and then how much total soil is needed in, in a nursery bed of basket or uh, the polythene cylinder. So if you are going for the rooting beds, which are only 2.5 inch, that means that if you are going for a depth of 2 point, uh, uh, sorry, if you are going for a depth of 2 inch only, then the soil will be only 1.5 cubic feet. 1.5 cubic feet soil will be required. If you are going for a depth of four inches, then you will require about three cubic feet of soil. So for two inch, 1.5 cubic feet. For four inch depth, you need three cubic feet. If you are going for direct bed plants with six inches top layer, six inches, then you need a 4.5 cubic feet of soil. Uh, this is the first three A, B, C is basically for the direct bedding. Now, if you are using polythene cylinder, so for polythene cylinder, for small polythene cylinders, you need about 5.3 uh, cubic feet of soil. For large uh, polythene cylinder, you need about 7 cubic feet. And for basket, which, are, uh, which we studied at the previous slide, baskets are about uh, 7 inch long and 5 inch diameter. So for the basket, you need about 4.5 cubic feet of the soil. So this is the, uh, the soil requirement will depend on the depth of the roots. And the soil requirement will depend on the, the size of the polythene cylinder you are using. In the next slide, I have tried to make a clear calculation for you so that uh, it is very easy for you to understand. So the total volume, the total volume of the earth required for one field acre. One field acre means about 6,000 cutting or the, the requirement of R to plant about 5,000 plants in one acre should be this much. Number one, if the rooting bed is two inch top layer, then you will need about 62 cubic feet of the soil. Three by three by two means what? Three inch, Lot three inch wide and two inch deep. If you are making a rooting bed of three inch lot, three inch wide and two inch deep, then the soil requirement will be about 62 cubic feet. If you are making four inch uh, deep, means three inch lot, four inch wide and four inch deep, then the, the, the requirement of the soil will be 167 cubic feet. If you are going for direct bed with six inch deep, means four inch long, four inch wide, and six inch deep, then you need about 300 
and 33 cubic feet of the soil. If you are going for small polythene uh, cylinders, then the requirement is about 1500 cubic feet of the soil. For large, uh, uh, sorry, for the small polythene cylinder, it is about 450 cubic feet. For the large polythene cylinder, it is about 1500 cubic feet. And for the basket, it is about 450. Now, uh, the lower calculation is quite interesting. If you are making root thin bed two inches, and then you go for small polythene cylinder, then you need to add A and D. Please try to understand this. If you make two inch bed and you are using small polythene cylinder, small polythene cylinder, then you need to add A and D. So A and D mean 62 and 450. So you need 512 cubic feet soil. If you are going for rooting bed, which is four inch, and you are using small polythene cylinder, so then you need to add B and D. B and D mean 167 plus 450. So that you will be needing a soil of about 617 cubic feet. Then if you are using, uh, if you are going for two inch deep rooting and want to use large polythene cylinder, then you need to add A plus E. So A plus E means 62 plus 1500. So you need 1,562 cubic feet of the soil. If you are going for rooting bed, which is four inches deep, and you want to use large polythene cylinder, so then you need to add B plus E. B plus E means 167 plus 1,500. So you need 1,667 cubic feet of the soil. Now, if you want to go for two inch deep rooting layer, and you are going to use baskets, then you, uh, you can add A plus F. So A plus F means 62 plus 450, 512 cubic feet. If you are going for four inch deep rooting and you want to use basket, then you need to add B plus F. B plus F means 167 plus 450. So you need 617 cubic feet of the soil to make 6,000 cuttings or to grow 5,000 cuttings in one acre of the soil. So this is the requirement of the soil for you. And this calculation is very much universal. So it depends on, on no matter where you are going to make the nursery, but you first decide that whether you will go for two inch depth of the root or four inch depth or six inch depth, and then this will help you in making your arrangement for the, uh, for the uh, soil and your nursery. Then the volume of earth. Now let's make it very easy that how much will be the weight of the soil. So the volume of the earth required for direct bed planting, I mean the C is the smallest C, is the smallest N, direct planting into either small polythene cylinder or basket does not require much more. The combination of rooting bed and small polythene cylinder or rooting bed and basket require a little bit more and very large volume of soil is required when you are going to use large polythene cylinders. So for easy working, the following table is very much easy for you. One cubic feet of the soil is about 74 pound, 74 pound in weight. One cubic feet of wet soil is about 101 uh, pound. One cubic feet of tea fluff, the tea uh, uh, products, it is about 21 pound. And one cubic feet of tea fluff and subsoil in proportion one to five means if you are, if you are making a mixture of tea fluff and soil, one ratio five, then the one cubic feet of that mixture will be 60 pounds, and 20, 24 cubic feet of loose soil is about 2,240 2, pounds. So this is how you can convert your volume into uh, weight or weight into volume, depending on your convenience, whatever is better for you. And if you want to convert, pound into kilograms, so it is also very easy. You convert pound into 
kilograms. Then uh, let's talk about the memory. So uh, please remember that we have so far, we talked about the uh, T general introduction. We talked about the method of propagation, the two common method of propagation. We talked about the seeds. We talked about the cuttings. Then after that, we talk, well, generally talk about the requirements of the uh, nursery, what types of environment is needed for the nursery. Then we talk about the land, how much land you require. And we also discuss the soil requirements. Now let's talk about the manual. Manual means organic matter. How much organic matter you are supposed to apply. And this is very much important that this operation should commence 8 to 12 weeks after planting. After the cuttings have already rooted. So please do not add organic matter before. You can add organic matter only once the rooting has already started. And commence with six to eight application of a starter mixture number one, applied once at fortnight about four ounces per 10 gallon of water on approximately 10 square yards of the soil, followed by two to four ounces of organic matter such as uh, streamil A per square yard. I have explained this mixture in the next slide. Okay, what, what are the uh, nutrients in uh, starter mixture number one? And what are the, the, the nutrients in the other uh, organic matter? But for you, it is to, to understand easily. Starter mixture number one is a mixture of organic matter. You can apply it six to, uh, six to eight times uh, every fortnight. And how many? You take four ores of the mixture. 10 gallon of water and apply it to the 10 square yard of the nursery. Manor should be scraped in with a small stick or iron prong and care should be taken not to manor too near the cutting because this will scorch the leaves. This is again very important application method. Please, when you are applying the manor, don't put the manor too close to the, the plant cutting because it will destroy the, the plant, it will have a negative effects on the leaves. So there should be a little bit space between the cutting and the manual so that there is no negative effect. And diluted cattle urine or cattle manual and water, it has produced excellent results. So if you want to apply cattle urine or cattle manual, that is also one of the uh, very feasible solutions. Often after the cuttings are planted and the shed put on, no further attention is given for several months. And this is a very common mistake which should be avoided. So uh, the, from the research, we have found that many people, they do not give proper attention to their, uh, to their nursery. They, they just put the, the cuttings, uh, apply the shed, and then they just forget about the care. This should not be the case you should be regularly monitoring your nursery and see if there is any problem regarding the weeds, if there is any problem regarding the organic matter uh, requirements, if there is any problem regarding the insect or any problem regarding the other diseases. So you should be very much vigilant while the nursery is developing in the, uh, the soil. These are the uh, composition of different mixtures. So T divided T175 mixture, this is the mixture which, which is the highest proportion of nitrogen, about 20.6%. And it has uh, about 14% or 15% of phosphorus and 12% of potassium. And then we have a streamil A mixture, which is about 6.4% nitrogen, 9% phosphorus, and 9% potassium. And the starter mixture number one, which should be applied in the beginning, it has about 13.9% or almost 14% nitrogen, 17% phosphorus, and 12% potassium. So these are some of the very much common organic manuals which are applied for the nursery and the uh, beds. Now, weeding, spray, and pest management. So, so now we have developed the nursery, okay? We have, we have talked about the nursery general condition, the land, the soil, the manual. Now we are needed to, to take care of the nursery. So the, for taking care, the first thing which we need is the weeding. Weeding means removal of unwanted plants. Weeding means 
removal of unwanted plants. So regular weeding is necessary, and the best way of weeding is to do by hands. Application of weedicide or spray, it will it might have a negative effect. So it is always better to do hand weeding, means remove the unwanted plants by, by hands. And please, when you are removing the, the, the weeds, uh, do make sure that the soil is not much disturbed. Now, during wet weather condition, all cuttings and plants in the nursery should be spread regularly with copper fungicides. Copper, because this fungicide is very much useful to remove any fungal attack. And one pound of uh, 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 one ounce of the uh, uh, this copper fungicide should be mixed with 10 gallons of water and you can spray at an interval of five to seven days. So this will be very much helpful if the condition is wet, if there is rainy season or if there is a, a chance of fungal attack. So you please make sure to spray. Then the pest management, a periodical check should be made for pests such as tea aphids, thips, mealy bugs, scale insects, yellow mite, cutworms, and particularly white grubs. These uh, are the common insects which can attack on the tea nursery. And whenever you see any of them, please directly go for the, uh, uh, for the spray so that the pests are properly managed. Otherwise, they will destroy your uh, nursery. These are the photos of these insects. These are the, uh, means the tea aphid, trips, really all these insects are, uh, these, these are the photos, you can identify them. And uh, whenever you see some of them in your nursery, directly go for the spray to avoid any kind of, uh, of, of the negative impact. Then, now we are done. We have completely organized our nursery. The land is, uh, is, is arranged, the soil is prepared, everything. So now we are going to go for the bed preparation and cutting. So it is necessary to decide well in advance what cutting are to be planted. What cuttings uh, means what, what size of the cutting and what age of the cutting. This should be decided in advance. When preparing nursery bed, it is recommended that beds should be three feet wide and six to nine, feet, uh, nine inches high so that uh, the, 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 the weight of the, nurse, the bed should be three feet and height of the uh, bed should be six to nine inch. The arch should be loosened to a depth of about 12 to 15 inches. Okay, the 12 to 15 inch means of the bed, the, the soil should be loose. All stones, roots, gravels, remove all these things from the arch. And if, the, if you see that there are big parts of the, of the arch, please, cut it down with something so that the earth is looser. It is generally designed to use the jungle soil with a good texture. Good texture means the soil which has a sufficient amount of sand, silk, and clay. That is called good soil. And jungle soil is one of the best. If deep plump is used in any soil mixture, it should be added in the proportion of one to five. If you, are, if you want to use deep fluff, there is nothing wrong but apply tea fluff in the ratio of means 20% should be tea fluff and 80% uh, should be uh, the uh, soil. The mixture should be allowed to decompose for about three, three weeks before use, being frequently turned over during this period and lightly water. Before you are going to cut, uh, to put the cuttings, you prepare the mixture and keep it for about three weeks. Turn around them frequently and provide water to them. Imported peat moss can be mixed with the existing nursery soil for better results. So this is the protocol. These are some of the guidelines to make the beds. Then once you are done with the beds, now it is the time for you to select the mother bush. Mother bush means the plant from where you are taking the cuttings to, to plant in your nursery. The mother bush is the plant where you, which you are going to use for the cuttings to take from there and put in your, your nursery. So remember that 
The success of vegetative propagation, it depends on the selection of outstanding mother bush. So with the required attributes and characteristics, which in turn would facilitate towards swift and easy mean of propagation. So these are some of the characteristics which I have compiled for you. If these properties are there, then the mother bush don't use that for your nursery. Number one, if the mother bush was an educate bush spread with upright habit, so then you don't use for the go for that one. If the mother bush is not healthy, the leaves are not healthy, the branches are not healthy, please don't use that for the propagation. Number two, if the internodes are very sharp, internodes mean that the space between two branches. So if the space between two branches is very short, please don't go for that one and don't use that as a mother bush for your uh, nursery. If tendency to produce more bungee buds, bungee bud means the buds which are producing early flowers and they are not very healthy. If you see that some plant is producing early flowers and the branches are not healthy, the leaves are not very good green and not, not very healthy, please don't go for that one as a mother bush. And having few maintenance leaves, such bushes would be weak due to low start results. If uh, the mother bush, the leaves are not very strong, the leaves are small and not, uh, not dark green, you please don't use that one as a mother bush because that mother bush will have very limited starch, very limited store food, and that is why the, the, consequently the recover will be too slow and then the plant will be weak. So you will develop a weak nursery. Then what character you should use? So these are some of the characteristics which you can use in the mother bush. Then you see that the mother bush has with high density of plucking points per unit area on the top surface, then that is the best one to be used as a mother bush. What does that mean? It means that if you see that the mother bush has many points which can be cut for the mother, for the nursery, then you go for that one, that is the best option. Then the second character is the bushes with large leaves, generally they produce heavier plucking shoots and then they can give you higher yield. This is the second one. Remember that in the tea, we are interested in the leaves. So any plant which can give us very good healthy leaves, that will be the best one. Number third, bushes with a natural spreading habit will support a wider plucking table and the economic base of the bush will generally healthy and abundant maintenance of the foliage, that is better. So the, the, the bush which can produce more branches, more, which can produce more leaves and which can go large, uh, which can produce large number of, of uh, branches, that will be the best one. Long internodes, the plants near the, the space between the two branches is long, that is the best option. So in the previous slide, we talked about that the, if there is small spacing, that is not good. If the internodes are large, then that is the best option for you to go for the mother bush. And set to recover after pruning. So the, the, the plants, which have very, very fast recovery, which can recover from the cutting very easily, that will be the best option for you to select as a mother bush. So in, in summary, you should select a plant which is very healthy, where the leaves are abundant, where the root, the, the growth of the plant is much more, and which is healthy, that can be used as a mother bush to select cuttings, and then those cuttings could be used in the nursery. Then, once you select the mother bush, now it is the time for you to planting the cuttings. You have collected the cuttings from the mother bush. Now you have it is the time for you to use those cuttings in the nursery. So the common set method are number one: cuttings are directly put in the beds uh, with the subsoil and deep lab and the, the about four to six inches top layer. This is one. Means you take the cuttings. You put in the bed with a, with a depth of about four to six inch, and you have mixed the 
bed with the deep love and also the soil. This is one method. Number two, cutting direct in the basket. Okay, you put the cutting and put in the basket with the soil and deep love. This is this another method. Number three, cutting direct in the polythene beds with soil and deep love, and cutting direct in bed with nursery soil and peat moss. These are the four possible ways. Any of them can be used. But satisfactory results have been obtained from all of the four methods, but cost is very different. Space factor has to be given serious consideration. So depending on your available land and depending on our, your available budget, you can select any of these four methods depending on your situation. As soon as the beds are ready to receive the cuttings, a light watering should be done. Now you prepare the beds, you provide a light irrigation and then put the uh, cuttings there. Single node cuttings consisting of one full leaf and, and the node should be taken in the shed with a very sharp knife, okay? And immediately placed in the large levinized bucket filled with water. So you cut the plant, the cutting very with very sharp knife, immediately put in the bucket with water so that the cutting is uh, cutting remain healthy and to prevent from drying. And then planting should commence as quickly as possible after the cutting have been taken. So don't waste time. When you remove a cutting from the mother bush, you use a very sharp knife, cut the cutting, put in the water, and then as soon as possible, you go for the plantation in the nursery. So that will be the planting protocol. After this is done, then you are now ready. The nursery is ready. You have provided with soil, everything is there. The cuttings are already in the, 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 the beds. Now you need to have shed and also you need to have water. So shedding and watering are interdependent operation. If you have more shed, you will need less water. If you have less shed, then you will have more water, you will require more watering. But axes are both, mean more shed and more water, both is not good, okay? It, it will, uh, if you have more shed and if you have more watering, it will be causing very uh, poor development of the roots, rotting of the roots, and that is why it decreases uh, growth. The ideal should be to have medium shed which is sufficient for the very light penetration of sunlight. Shed should be such a way where the light can pass and can reach the, the, the plant. But the shed should be in such a way where the light can reach, but the temperature inside the nursery is not very high. In order to avoid wilting and sun scratch immediately after planting, water should be done in small quantities and often so that the atmosphere under the shade is reasonably humid and cool. Please remember that what, after the planting are uh, planted in the, in the nursery, so in the initial days, you provide more irrigation, means not more, not more water, more means frequent irrigation, again and again, so that there is no scratching and uh, heat shock. Various methods of shading can be adopted, but the cheapest is break and farm. If the breaker farm is available, it is the cheapest one. It is inserted in the cluster between the cuttings and along the side of the beds. I think I have some photos where you can see in the next slide. And variation which have been proved successful are, number one, using the taller farm in the middle of the bed and the shorter on the side, that is uh, more useful. Using farm of one height, at least two feet tall, that is also useful. Building a frame with stout poles round the bend with small cross poles sufficiently close on the top to insert sharp form over the top of the frame. And form has to be inserted along the sides. This is also one of the uh, method. And other methods are bamboo slats, iron or bamboo hooves with open wave coil metering is also. So it depends on the availability of the material. You can use any of these shading. These are the common methods of shedding. You can use any of them depending on your budget and depending on the availability of the 
uh, of the material. So you can use either bamboo or you can use uh, as, uh, the, uh, the uh, farms. Then after this is done, we need to go for the transplanting. Now our nursery is ready, plants are developed. So now it is the time for us to take the plants from the nursery to the field. That is called transplanting. So remember that my lecture was about the nursery management and field transplanting or field planting. So nursery management is done. Now it is time for us to talk about the transplanting. The idea to be achieved in the nursery should be a high percentage of cutting successfully rooted, which are healthy, vigorous plants, 10 to 12 inch high at nine to 10 months. This is the ideal. If your nursery can give you plants which are 10 to 12 inch high in nine to 10 months and very healthy with very good roots, you are done. You are, your nursery is perfect. Then there are three methods of transplanting which any of them can be used, three methods. Number one, cutting and closing beds are transplanted into basket and finally transplanted into the field. From the nursery, you remove the cuttings with the basket, uh, with the roots, you put them in the basket and then you go to the field. This is one method. Cuttings are planted direct into the basket of polythene bags and these are transplanted into the field. So if you have used the basket or polythene bags in the nursery, you remove the bags along with the rooting, uh, uh, sorry, along with the cutting, you remove the bags and then put those bags directly into the field. Number third, cuttings are planted directly into the bed and transplanted directly from the nursery into the field. The third method, if you have not, if you did not use any of the, uh, any of the bed, uh, any of the basket or any of the polythene bags, you have put directly cutting into the field. So you remove the, the, the cutting carefully with the roots and then go to the field. The use of closing or rooting bed is a, uh, is a thing of the past. It is now unnecessary and cost the nursery space. Everything is important. So the, the first method is not very common now. That, that uh, is expensive and it needs lots of space. The use of basket is expensive, but assuming that only small number of plants are handled each year, as in the case of multiplication plots and small cl uh, clonal blocks, or in the plants are liable to tie subjected to long periods or drought. Although the baskets are expensive, but if you are using few plants each year, then this option is the best one to use the, to uh, cutting the, the plants, the remove of planting from the uh, nursery, put in the basket and then go for the field. But if you are using very large number of plants, then you can use the third method where you can use direct beds, remove the cutting from, from the bed and go directly into the field. So either of the method can be used depending on your budget and depending on your situation. Now, direct planting and polythene cylinder, however, has so far given excellent results and costs are a good deal lower than when using the basket. Because polythene bags are not very much expensive. So you can use direct planting at the polythene bags and the bed, then you remove the plant with the polythene cylinder and go for the planting and the field. These cylinders have many advantages over the basket. For example, disintegration is less. The soil is held together more compactly. Moisture retention is great and therefore watering is reduced from a daily to bi-weekly operation and manure is not leached out as easily. So this method has many advantages. For example, the, if you are using the, the polythene bag, this is more advantageous because it can help, it can retain moisture, the soil is more compact and it, can, the, it will reduce the cost of uh, irrigation and it will also keep the, 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 the organic matter for a long time. And when large areas are to be planted, involving hundreds of thousands of plants, then the realistic approach should be adopted. The realistic approach means if you, can not, if you have very huge land and you are going for that one, then maybe polythene bags is also not a good option for you. Basket is also not a good option for you. Then you can directly go for the 
uh, third option, which is directly planting the, the cutting in the nursery, removing those planting with the roots, and then directly planting in the field. So that could be the most feasible option for you. So I think that's all for my presentation. And I think I was exactly on time, uh, about one hour. So should I stop sharing my screen now or we'll go for the question? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ola. Yes. So, so should much I for your lecture. Most welcome. So uh, should I start? That's okay. Sharing? Okay. That's okay. Um, now is the Q&A section. Um, uh, Um, please allow some time. They are thinking about like what can they ask you. Okay, so I got one question in the chat box as well. I think. Yeah,有任何想要问的问题，专业方面的或者老师个人的研究方向，或者说老师的大学或者泰国、巴基斯坦什么都可以。Ah, uh, so one question I got from uh, <laughs> here. That uh, should all the nurseries be nearby water? Should we need to build an irrigation system if the nursery locates in an area that lacks water? And that is a very good question. I really uh, uh, support this idea. Uh, the, uh, water, as I, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, you, the, the nursery area should not be under permanent water. But it doesn't mean that you don't need water. Water for irrigation is always required. So it depends on your location. If your location is close to water, then probably you need a very simple setup for irrigation. But if you are making the nursery in some area which is away from the source of water, then of course you need to have a very good system for irrigation. And depending on the locality and depending on the soil, depending on the organic matter content, you need to irrigate the soil. I hope it is it, it clarified. Thank you so much for your answer. Most welcome. Any other question? I have a one team, ma. Go ahead, Hong Xue. And this one more. Uh, by the way, if we plant the tea in the indoor nursery, we should also consider the weather too. I mean, since we can control the temperature and application with our system, is it still important to consider that? No, if, if you are, uh, that, that is not the, the question of the, the practical situation. So if you are going for nursery within the closed uh, environment, which is under control, it means you can control the temperature, you can control the moisture, then you probably don't need to go for the other consideration, natural consideration. But what I was talking about is for the not for the common farmers who don't have the luxury to control the environment within their nursery, which are dependent on the natural uh, situation. So for them, they definitely have to consider the natural conditions. But if you can con uh, control the condition within the nursery, then you, you can still uh, think about the soil. You can think about the irrigation, but you don't probably need to go for the to, to think about the temperature and others because that is already under control. And your next question is: If someone to if someone wants to improve the yield of the tea, do you suggest there to plant different varieties in one nursery by dividing them into different blocks? This question is very subjective. It. Okay, uh, we can we can recommend different varieties. In this question, you, you, you have an excellent uh, question. I really appreciate this one. But remember that every variety cannot be growing well in every condition, right? So it depends if, if uh, for example, I'm growing in the central plain of Thailand. 
let suppose i give you my example so in the central plain of thailand we can grow only a particular variety of the tea so we have to think of increasing our yield only by making some arrangement with that particular variety multiplication of varieties will not help at all uh, i can give you an example from pakistan i i come from the north east uh, 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 sorry north north west of pakistan which is close to china means we uh, the silk road i i come from that area which is close to the silk road we have one area hazara division where we grow some kind of tea but the major problem there is the this one that we can grow only one kind of tea the indian tea if we go for any other variety that doesn't grow there well so in that uh, situation we can suggest to the people some kind of agronomic management practices where which are relevant to that one variety only if they grow more varieties that will not help in increasing their yield ha huh. if you have a, uh, a environment which is under controlled condition and we can grow many varieties at the same time then this is very much uh, recommended option to to divide the nursery into different blocks and then within each block you grow different varieties and it will help you grow in quality not only the yield but it will also improve the quality of your product because some people will be interested in one variety some will be interested in another variety so you can probably increase the market demand also with this way i hope it it clears thank you so much that's our really deep oh, um, answer to the question i think the students have um learn a lot from today's lecture if there's no more question um more question